Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Daily Objective brought to you by the Ayn Rand Center UK. Um, we're always bringing you controversies and uh, current events from an objectivist perspective. And this one is about as controversial and current as you can get. The bank failures that have been happening in threes so far, um, what does it mean for us in the future? Is, is, it, uh, is it foretelling something catastrophic? What are the reasons for it? How can we understand what the heck is going on? The banking system is so complicated, crazy, circuitous. Um, so how can us normies negotiate uh, this uh, complicated problem? To help us uh, navigate this crazy territory, we have Seth Levine. Hi, Seth. How are you? Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Glad to be with you guys. Awesome. Always great to have you. And Jonathan Honig, the great Jonathan Honig. How are you, Jonathan? Great to be with you both. Thank you. Look, listening Excited to listen, learn, and uh, uh, communicate with our super chatters as well. Great. So, yes, yeah, Seth. Um, so you you wrote a little article. Was it an article, or was it just a, a, a position piece or paper on yeah. the causes of the the recent bank failures? If you want to talk about it a little bit, sure, absolutely. Well, before I uh, before I should start before I start, I should uh, give the uh, financial guy disclosure. Disclosure: These are just my opinions, not my. Uh, not my employer, uh, personal opinions, not solicitation of buy or sell any securities, you know, do your own work. This is not investment advice. Uh, a lot of, you know, you guys have, should be familiar with this, but basically, you know, I'm not taking any responsibility for anything that comes that anyone acts on, my, on, on the part of the words of what I say. So with that out of the way, and we're all safe, uh, <laughs> which is funny. Um yeah, so this is a, this is pretty interesting. So, um, you know, any, any, anyone who knows me or who who doesn't or want to know about me can check out the website and follow me on you know all the spaces there. But um, this is um, you know I'm an investor and uh, you know watching what's going on in Silicon Valley Bank and some of these other banks, you know, regional banks, um, and including Credit Suisse, which um, for anyone who doesn't know, there's been about four bank failures. Um, over the past couple of weeks or so, um, with um, some others kind of undergoing uh, significant stress as well. And there's a lot of, at least for me, kind of eerie connections back to the financial crisis, which was uh, pretty formative in my uh, in my career, um, trying to be um, you know mindful of my biases kind of surrounding that. But they do share a similar trait. And um, that's uh, that's what I've written about kind of in, in my recent piece. And uh, sort of the causes behind that are a little bit implied too that that we can get into. But you know, when you see what's going on, you know, and you know, from my perspective, right, I'm an investor, right, so I, I deal in this world of risk and committing capital. Um, you now, so my personal view, of what's going on is that we're in a, a situation of elevated risk, and why are we in a situation of elevated risk? Really relates to what's called duration risk. And duration risk is just a fancy name for uh, risk related to interest rates. So as I'm sure a lot of people know, um, interest rates have been low, practically zero, um, you know, since uh, just after the financial crisis. Now, keep in mind, this is not all interest rates. This is the rates that the, I'll just keep it to the Fed because that's that's my best understanding. So the interest rates that the Fed directly controls. Now, people think the Fed controls all interest rates. That is false. Um, the Fed does, does you know, what the Fed does, does influence other rates. But interest rates move around for all. There's, there's an infinite amount of interest rates because there's no one interest rate. Um, and they all move for different reasons driven by the market. Take it a step back, you know, this period of low interest rates, what it's done is it's built up a lot of what's called duration risk or interest rate risk. So if you are a fixed income investor, like a bond investor, like a bank, for example, what you do is you buy a lot of um, you buy a lot of bonds or even loans or whatever. You have a lot of investments that have a fixed rate associated with them. So you are going to get a fixed amount of money back, right? Every you know, half a year or a quarter or a year, depending on which, you know, what your, in, what your specific uh, debt you're investing in, you get money back in a fixed amount. So what happens is when interest rates go up, the value of your, of your, of your fixed income securities, they go down and it's, you know, I could get into it uh, or not, but it's really just a mathematical equation. There's nothing really 
um, you know, there's no real opinion associated with it. This is just kind of how it is because as rates go up, that just means your prevailing interest rate that you could earn if you invested new money now would be higher. So the value of your old money invested at a fixed rate is lower. So as the Fed kind of rose interest rates very quickly um, over the past year, what happened was these banks that had invested in fi large fixed income related investments, all those dropped in value because the interest rates available in the marketplace significantly rose and those were all tied to the Fed. So what happened is now you have all these financial companies and you have a lot of people too, but we're specifically talking about financial companies who have a lot of what's called unrealized losses um, in their portfolios. Mm -hmm. These are just, in other words, their bond portfolios that if they were to sell it today, they would be worth less money. Um, now, I think there's little um, there's little controversy for me saying that the a lot of the securities that these banks who failed held, with, with, with maybe the exception of Credit Suisse, but let's talk about the regional banks, were very high quality in nature. So the real risk. So there's very little probability, in my view, of those uh, of not getting paid your full amount. Uh, you know, of bonds at maturity. That is the key. The key is at maturity. So uh, unfortunately, the way how banks work is when a, a bunch of people come and they want their money right now, the bank has to give them their money right now. That's called liquidity. And the only way that these banks can actually generate that liquidity is by selling some of their asset portfolios. So by selling the assets in their portfolio the, to pay out the uh, the demand from depositors leaving, the banks are actually taking those losses that were unrealized and they're actually realizing them because they have to sell them. So what the bank thought they were going to get, you know, you know, a, a hundred cents on the dollar for, they actually sold at 91 cents on the dollar for. And what happened is this, this basically just caused the bank to fail because mm -hmm. banks are what I call a levered carry trade. Um, and I, in fact, Many entities in life are like this, but basically what a bank does is it borrows money from depositors for the most part, but also from bondholders in other ways. And it goes out and lends that and invests that. And the bank earns money in between. So what happens is these very small losses, like just for the moment, like these very small losses actually have giant uh, implications for banks. And that's what happened with uh, with the banks today. Can I, can I ask you a question real fast? Um, sure. Some of this seems to be a a problem endemic to the um, fractional reserve system. I mean, it, it feels a little fraudulent to take in money that somebody thinks is held in reserve for them, and then to loan that out, say without their permission, um, knowing that they have a hundred percent claim to that money that's going that's in there that is no longer actually there. Yeah. Well, this is a very um... Let me see, sort of, uh, you know, lightning rod of a, of a topic, for lack of a better word. But actually, uh, you know, <clears throat> what the banks are doing is fractional reserve banking. Uh, it is not fraudulent. Um, and those are two separate topics. So the, why it's not fraudulent, per se, is because, you know, the bank doesn't claim that that's your money. When you deposit your money with your bank, you know, your sort of contracts, as I understand it, stipulate that you are basically lending the bank money. Um, so the bank is not safeguarding your money. The bank is actually borrowing your money. And that is why they're paying you. Uh, but that's, this is, that's why they're paying you, or they used to pay you at least a, um, uh, you know, um, an interest rate on your deposit, right? That's why people kept banks money with banks. Cause they would actually earn, earn a return on them. You know, if they were in the bank store, you know, so banks are not in the storage business. Banks are in the borrowing and lending business, or as I call it, a carry trade. If banks were in the storage business, um, they would actually you would actually have to pay the bank um, to to do that because otherwise they would have no way of of you know you know if they had to keep your money and they weren't couldn't touch it, it cost them money to safeguard your money. How would they be in business? Correct. They could store, but they could also contract with you to lend out your money. And in that respect, you, you most people think of a bank not in the way in the in the actual way that you're talking about it, but as a safeguard for their money. And that's yeah. not actually what's happening. And but, they, but, but Mark, and let me jump in for a minute. Isn't isn't that I think what I understood this the center of Seth's article was kind of making the point that as you're alluding to, it's not 
a free market in which one can choose to have fractional reserve banking necessarily or not. All of these banks are a product of, I mean, I know Dr. Brooke described them as uh, public private partnerships. Yes. You know, so there, I mean, Seth, all the banks that failed, these are highly regulated institutions, right? That are directly influenced by the Federal Reserve with almost no way to avoid that or be independent of that, as I understand. Yeah, I mean, banking is uh, one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world. Like, I mean, to, to you know, in my opinion, like, I if we had a free market in banking, I mean, I don't think banks would look like this in any way, shape, or form. I mean, banking crises throughout history are quite common, and it's all the same reasons for, and it's all the same, more or less, it's all the same banking structure. It's, you know, they're borrowing people's money on the short, you know, in, in a, you know, the borrowing people's money with the with the requirement to pay them back very quick in a very short window, and they go out and they invest in um in longer dated in longer dated uh, assets, and they really try and manage that liquidity is what it's called. You know the the needs of the business, um, and that's what the business of banking is. And I, I don't you know it's very risky because it's there's a lot of leverage in the business, um, which means it can they can fail very quickly, and that's basically what we've seen you know time and time again throughout history. Um, but there's a lot of reasons, I guess. I mean, banking, why banks are even this unsafe too is more you know there's like a lot of reasons for this, um, and if you go back to even like pre uh, Fed Federal Reserve. Um, there was some regulation that created a lot of instability that led up to the creation of Federal Reserve, ironically enough, which in my view creates instability as well. But back before the Fed, you had these laws that prevented um, or various regulations that prevented banks from branching. So basically, mm. you would have to be like a one branch in one, in one, one area. And what that did is it just basically created a lot of um, geographic risks. So let's say you're a bank in, I don't know, Ohio, right? Um, if you know, and you own one bank in Ohio because you can't really branch out because that's not allowed. Well, chances are you're, you're a bank in Ohio in the like late 1800s. Who are your customers going to be? I mean, most likely farmers, right? Farmers, yeah. Right. So you know, one thing we know: what if there's a drought in Ohio? Well, guess what? That's bad for farmers. And guess what? All your customers are farmers, so all your customers are going to go out of business at the same time, and you know that's going to leave you short. You know, that's going to that's going to cause your bank to fail. Whereas if you were allowed to branch, well, maybe you have a bank in, you know, Pittsburgh, and maybe you have a bank in New York, and maybe you have a bank in, I don't know, like, you know, Florida, or, you know, where A, the weather is different, B, your customers are different. Um, but basically, because of these regulations, they keep, you know, they really prevent banks from um, from from diversifying their risks. Now, I also think today, like the whole business model of of banks of like having deposits that are short and then having to manage longer term assets to earn your return like that would probably look different in a laissez-faire kind of system too whereas like maybe banks would maybe in order to deposit your money you would have to agree to the bank to give them you know you know maybe they'll allow you to have i'm going to make things up maybe 10 percent of your money anytime you want it but 50 percent of your money within maybe three months and then you know all of your money within a year I don't know, but whatever that's, that is, that, that would, yeah. That's what makes sense to me. That's that, that seems like, oh, you're making a contractual agreement. You understand exactly how much money you have on hand, as opposed to the thought that that money you deposit is 100% reserved for you yeah. to take at any well, time. I mean, it's not. You didn't, don't they have that? It's called a CD or a time yeah. deposit. That's true they, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. They you know, do. I don't, yeah, like yeah. I, I'm not a I'm not a an expert in sort of the banking sort of regulations, uh, you know that and 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 restrictions. You know, I I know enough to kind of be dangerous, but you know, but you know, even as an investor, like this is the lay of the landscape, and like looking at the landscape, the investment landscape that that exists right now, like I believe because of because we've had such wild swings in interest rates, which by the way I would attribute to the to the existence of central banks. Um, because we have such wild swings in interest rates and like and a lot of interest rates, it's created this, I believe, sort of a higher risk environment that like as an investor, and this is where I think, you know, kind of my views are a little bit different. Just like as an investor, like I don't need to have as much risk on in this in this kind of environment. Like that's my own personal opinion. And like maybe I'm wrong. Maybe markets like shrug this off and go on, you know, go rallying and like that's okay. Like 
you know, but maybe I'm right. Maybe, you know, this leads to more stress in the financial system and, you know, markets go down. I mean, this, when you're in investing, you know, the, you're, you're dealing with the unknown and trying to make kind of probability assessments. It what seems it, like, you know, let me ask, just, just, we ask, you know, is the banking system at risk? If someone has their money in a bank, less than, I guess, quarter of a million dollars, should they be worried? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to make that assessment for anyone else because I don't know. Um, you know, you know, like I still have let, you know, I still have money in a bank, um, you know, take that for what it's worth. And you've, you've seen a lot of money. It's not like you've seen, I don't know the numbers, but it's not like all the money has left the banking system. What has happened, um, what has happened, some of the, some money has left kind of smaller banks and have fled in and have gone into what's called the big money center banks. So these are the global kind of banks, like your JP Morgan's of the world, your Bank of America is right. These are kind of bigger banks with more diversified businesses and and, ge and geographies and what have you. Where and also, you know, there's sort of I think some people believe that there's um, and understandably so they believe that there's an uh, input, you know, too big to fail banks where like you know the government will bail you out no matter what. Um, I think that's sort of a reason for some of the capital flight too. So maybe people are leaving some of the smaller banks where they feel like they're more at risk and going into larger banks. There are other people who are taking their money out of banks altogether because quite honestly, today, you know, there've been market innovations where you don't necessarily need to keep your cash in, in, um, in banks. Like you could own a money market mutual fund. And in that case, Mark, that mutual fund is actually taking your money, buying fixed income securities, um, you know, of, of various kinds. And um, you can take that out. You know, I, I think, I think most are daily, daily redemption, but it, it would, it would, you would have to check with the individual kind of um, with the individual uh, mutual fund you're holding or money market fund they're in. And they charge you a fee, you know, they'll charge you a couple of basis points expense fee, you know, for the administration work associated with, with, you know, managing your funds. Um, so, so you're seeing I some money fleeing to that. It, it, it seems like the Fed is between a rock and a hard place because they have to get inflation under control. So they have to raise interest rates to get inflation under control, it seems. Um, but by the same token, given the, the nature of the investments of these banks, that's putting several of them at risk. Also, Euron Brook brought something up the other day, which I thought was very interesting. I don't know, Jonathan, if you heard about it, that these particular banks were targeted for Bitcoin. Did you Did you see that? And that the, the Fed was sort of coming down on 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 Bitcoin. You should see that episode. It's a, sort of intriguing. Um, what first of all, what can the Fed do? Because if they lower them back down again, aren't are we getting back into the same encouragement of the boom bust cycle and and inflation again? I mean, what well, can they do? Well, they're all aren't they always wrong? I mean, central <laughs> planners can they ever rewrite? You know, how can eight people in DC pick the right interest rate. And Seth, as you point out, it's just the short end of the curve, but you know, can central planners ever be right? Oh my God, there's so much there. So first, like I don't, this whole concept of inflation, uh, I'm not gonna touch it there unless people really wanna kind of go onto it. Like I have a very different view of inflation. I write about it, you know, go on the website, ton about it. I actually don't think that makes any sense. I think it's a, almost a, a worthless concept in a fiat currency re regime because what do we mean by inflation, right? So back in the day when we had gold standard, for example, we had a monetary standard, right? Money actually had a standard of value that was objective. You could observe like an ounce of gold, like that's what a dollar is worth, you know, whether or not you like it or not, that tied this abstract concept of money and dollar to actually something tangible, concrete, like an ounce of gold. Um. You know, back then, inflation meant the debasement of the currency, which meant changing the amount of, you know, changing the amount that a dollar was worth relative to a monetary standard. So when we went from, you know, a dollar, you know, 20, you know, when we went from $21 was an ounce of gold to $35 as an ounce of gold with FDR in 1934, that changed the standard. That meant every inch and everything measured in an inch was devalued versus the standard, which would be an ounce of gold. Right now we live in a in a in a, a fiat currency world, like which just means there is no objective standard, which means money is is completely subjective and worth whatever people are willing to trade for it. So to say that money is worth less now, 
you don't know if it is because there's no standard, right? So your currency, you don't know where it's worth less. So what we've done in its place is we've, this is actually a, 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 a this actually historically started the uh, change in the late 1850s and was made popularized by uh, John Maynard Keynes. Um, we changed um, the meaning of inflation to, um, you know, debasement of currency to just rising prices in general. So now, like anytime price goes up, we call that inflation. Well, that's kind of silly because prices go up and down for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with currency. So now we have, you know, I would argue prices, and I've written about it on the blog, like prices now, why are prices high now? Well, I'm very intimately involved with a lot of different industries. Like there are shortages, right? This has nothing to do with necessarily the, you know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but like there are shortages of, of goods and services. Um, related to a lot of different things. Is that because of money, monetary printing or not? Like, we don't know. Well, let's just say we don't know. But the what we do know is prices are up because demand is higher than supply. Supply is down and demand is either, you know, whatever it was. So um, to call this because of like, how does the Fed fight inflation? You know, what should the Fed do? Like, if I were, you know, king of the Fed, because I would just do this unilaterally, I would do nothing. And I've written about this in, uh, in, in, in an article too, something about like fed fed supply or something like that. I don't know, ping me and, and I'll tell you if you're interested, but basically what I see is these central planners and to Jonathan's point, there is no right interest rate, right? We are, there is no one person with one interest rate. There is no average interest rate. That's good for everyone. Everyone and every need has a specific interest rate. That's why bonds have, have, and and loans and everything of fixed income has a different rate. You know, if you and I go and um, and go apply for a mortgage, we're not going to get the mortgage rate. I'm going to get a rate. You're going to get a rate. Maybe it's the same. Maybe it's not. But it's going to be tailored to our individual situ- situations. And that's what that's what lending and investing is. So there is no right rate. So the Jonathan's point: the Fed is never right. The Fed can't be right because it's impossible because there is no one interest rate that satisfies everyone. Is there an interest rate that satisfies most people on average? Like, is that even a is that even valid? Like, I would even take question question upon that if that's even a valid sort of concept to even even have. But thus, because the Fed can never be right, and there are all these different interest rates. If I were the Fed, like the most harm it does is 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 you're seeing it right now. The Fed, the volatility in what the Fed is doing, because they're so big and powerful um, in the marketplace as a market participant. Uh, because they actually participate in markets, they create a lot of volatility. Mar- volatility is terrible for is te- is te- is um is terrible for markets and investing. So if I were Fed, I would just pick an interest rate, I would leave it there, and I would never touch it again. And then I would then I would disband the Fed and go back to free market and banking. But uh, let me let me ask a question. You know, knowing that there is no free lunch, is my sense is. The banking system is not at risk that they'll give you your pieces of paper back. It's just a question of whether those pieces of paper are going to buy what you expected or thought they could buy. Is that kind of a safe assumption? You know, people have a fear of think that the banks are going to fail. They're going to be lined up around the block, you know, carrying the, you know, like they'll give us our piece of paper back. Right. But it just, it's going to be worth less. Well, that would come down to a fiscal sort of action where like you literally have like, you know, money, like currency printing per se, you know, which is not necessarily something the Fed does, but that's complicated topic that most people kind of gloss over. It's kind of um, um, that I won't get into, but basically, um, you know, if you are, if you have less than $250,000, you are what's called FDIC insured, right? You are insured, you will get all your money back per se, because it is insured. Um, it is insured. So you will get it back. You don't know when you will get it back um, because, you know, the, it should be insured order, but like, you don't know, you're, you're basically now relying upon the government, uh, the government insurance agency to pay your claim at a certain time. Cause that's basically what you are going. It's basically what, what you get, you know? So when your bank fails, you basically have a claim. Now you either have an insurance claim against the FDIC to get your money back, or if you have more than that and your bank fails, you really just become a general creditor of the bank. And then there's a whole wind down, you know, in theory, there's a whole wind down process for banks. And, you know, very rare occasions do depositors actually lose all their money, but you may not have access to your money um, 
you know, for a prolonged period of time, which, you know, if you're running a business and you need, you need your cash to pay, you know, make payroll, you know, today, like that doesn't really help you. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, I know it's not oranges to oranges, but Lehman Brothers creditors waited like a decade or more to get some of their claims back, you know, and, and they weren't even paid in full. And again, it's, that's not an FDIC insured experience, but, um, you know, what, what's that Buffett line about when uh, the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fact. But there are also, you know, there are plenty, you know, why some of these banks have been impacted so, so much, um, you know, for example, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, um, as well as the other, what I call S banks in my article, because they all start with S, Signature and um, and Silvergate, you know, they had a lot of what's uninsured deposits. In other words, they had a lot of deposits that were over $250,000. So those, you know, in a sense, those deposits are more at risk and not getting paid back um, than, than anyone else because you're not, you know, insured for them, right? So imagine you have a, you know, imagine you have a car that's worth, um, that's worth $50,000 and you have $50,000 of insurance on it. Like, you know, you crash the car, you're like, ah, oh, that sucks for sure. But at least I'm going to make all, I'm going to get all my money back and be covered hundred percent. Now let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar car and you have $50,000 of insurance on it. Well, you may drive a little more carefully because you know, if you crash it, you're, you're going to lose half your value um, because only half of it is insured. There's another $50,000 that's not insured. So because a lot of these banks had a lot of uninsured deposits, their depositors were a little bit more skittish than maybe someone who wasn't insured. Because if you're insured, you're like, yeah, I'm still going to get my money back. Like, I don't need it all. If I have $250,000 in the bank, let's say, let's say, I don't need that now. Like, how much money do I need this year, right? So I'm not going to bother moving it. I'll just sort of sit it out because it's a pain in the butt to move, move money around. And it's fine. I, I don't need it. But if you had $20 million in the bank and you're like, well... Only two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm assured of the rest of it. If this bank fails, I'm going to have to like go through this lengthy process of getting it back. Well, then you may be more apt to move your money faster, um, and not you know, and not go through the heartache of a of you know of of a bank failure. And a lot, and that's that's what happened to to the S banks is that they had depositors flee um, flee, and because all their depositors fled, the banks now the banks were not do not appear to be well managed, but because they had all these losses in their investment portfolio, they couldn't get all the assets that they needed to, to, to pay for, you know, to pay their depositors and they ended up failing. The run, the classic run. Classic run. No one survives a run. And well, it seems to me the FDIC is a, a scary institution in itself. I think that it probably, um, don't you think it uh, incentivizes carelessness? And now that the the Fed is claiming they're going to back up all of these deposits, irrespective of whether they're insured or not, right? That was what they are saying. Doesn't this set a precedent now for even more carelessness and craziness and volatility in the system? I think absolutely. I mean, basically, you know, what you're doing is essentially what you're doing if you are going to uh, insure and backstop every depositor, which has been rumored in the press. It has not been uh, substantiated. Uh, you've seen Je uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen say it, walk it back, say it, walk it back. Uh, basically, like, what does that mean if you think about it? I mean, you're basically de facto nationalizing bank deposits. And if you think nationalizing bank deposits is a good idea, like why is that any why is why is that any better of idea than nationalizing search engines, right? Why is that any as you know, why is that a good idea? But we don't like to nationalize, you know, automobile manufacturing, right? Nationalizing anything uh, for this crowd here, I think we, I think we, we recognize that nationalization of industries um, is coercion and it's just bad in general. Well, um, don't give, don't give them the idea. They're gonna, they're, they're going. No, well, they, way. they're, yeah, they're not. Think, hey, they're not listening to me. And he, uh, but, you know, and that's no what shortage. ultimately I think is so frustrating. Is how does this all play out? Of course, is the greedy capitalist bankers effed us again, and we need more government control and regulations. Even the so-called conservatives, the Republicans, the defenders of capitalism, well, we really need to crack down more. You know, we to, you know, so it's like every every uh, incident created by the regulatory state prompts more regulation. You know, whether it was Sarbanes Oxley or the one after that, you know, it's. So every generation gets its latest spate of uh, 
uh, financial market regulation. And then they and then they blame and then they blame the failures on the little teeny bits of deregulation that that they decide to do that are really inconsequential. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the most fascinating things I've ever come across, like, and what really started me sort of down the integrating investor, which again is sort of my, which is my my blog and my vehicle for kind of explaining exploring these ideas that pretty counter. Uh, I don't really come across anyone who to has these views. So either I'm like really way out there wrong or, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, one of the things that, that, that led me down these was I came across uh, a period of time before the Fed existed in the U.S. I was like, I never heard about this. And it was called, you know, so-called the free banking period in the U.S. Hmm. And it was called free banking because there was no um, central bank. It was called free banking because it was freer. It was called free banking because it was there were literally states um, that adopted these free banking, free banking sort of uh, uh, a slate of uh, legislation that allowed that made it easier to start a bank. So these what were not. Year this was was, this? Well, this was up until Coolidge era. Yeah, it was, it's up until the the formation of the uh, of the Federal Reserve. So it's you know the antebellum period in the U.S. So post but even the U.S. bank, you're not considering that sort of a central bank, even though Bank of the United States was about sort of it went it came and, and went yeah. quite a bit of issues yeah well yeah i mean and that was i mean that was i guess that was that was pretty early on that came and went um but again this was not this period was not free by any stretch of the imagination it was just freer and what happened was you had all these other regulations like i said like the prohibition about of branching that created all these other risks that um were all unintended consequences of course um and that actually, you know, created a series of financial panics in the late 1800s in the U.S. and the early uh, 1900s in the U.S., which led to the formation of the Federal Reserve because people thought, "Hey, look at all, look at how unstable banking is. Um, we need, we we need a central bank." And really, a lot of the things that caused the panic, you know, if you look um, for me, uh, I think you know some of the two most experts uh, on this area are uh, era are uh, George Selgin and Larry White. They blog <laughs> at a, a place called Alt M, you know, Alt M dot org. It's Alt hyphen M dot org. You know, when they go and they examine kind of the period and see why these banks failed, you know, was it really unfettered capitalism gone array, um, or was it something else? Astray, I should say. Um, and really what they find, and I think it's pretty conclusive if you look at, if you actually look at the data, is regulation caused a lot of these bank failures. And it was it was not only just a prohibition about banking, which made which made for a system of very fragile small banks um, with very concentrated risks in each in each in each bank. But also there were things like you have to tie your currency issue. So banks used to issue their own currency. We used to have private currency. Without going down too deep into that, basically they had to tie their private currency, the amount that they issued, to government bonds. It's going to sound crazy, but there was a point in time where, government, where the U.S. government actually repaid their bonds. So what happened was these banks would lend out all this money as currency, and then the government would re and they had to buy bonds uh, to you know to back to back the currency. But then the currency, but then the government repaid all their bonds. So then the bank had a call in their currency. So basically you got to a point where like the, the banks could not actually provide currency to a growing economy, which, which it needs because the government repaid their bonds. Now that's a very responsible thing for government to do, but it was an irresponsible thing for a government to tie via regulation and law, the issuance of you know bank activity to, to the issuance of, of government bonds. So there are all sorts of these weird kind of interventions that made for pretty fragile um, a pretty fragile uh, banking environment. And, you know, I fear so, that. Yeah, it's like, as I said, it's like they, regulators do one, twist one little knob over here and don't see the corresponding effect. In this case, 110 years later, still doing yeah. it. Yeah, we're yeah, still. So folks, yeah. I, I think the moral of the story is the guys with the guns are the are the problem, not the people with the dollars. It's the guys with the guns. So focus on them, please, because they're the ones causing all the problems. Um, any more, anything to say before I make uh, the announcements for the upcoming no. show? Tell us what's coming up tonight. 
So tonight, 9 p.m. UK time, HBTV with Harry Binswanger and special guest Greg Salimieri on left and right, codependent foes. Love the title of that. I wish I could see that. I'm going to see it probably after it's all done. But everybody should tune in because they will have a unique perspective. Objectivists have a unique perspective on the left-right uh, establishment. And, yeah. uh, and, and I'll just say, could you think of two more informed guests, Dr. Benzwanger, who knew Miss Rand, worked with her, and Dr. Salmieri, who's a true expert in objectivism, published author. These are the highest quality possible experts that we bring you every day for free here. So thanks for the support. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff, folks. So tune in and tap their minds. You'll be better off for the effort. Well, Seth, thank you so much for uh, shedding some light on this very confusing issue. Jonathan Honig, thank you, as always, for coming in and lending your insights. And I guess I'll see you on some other Daily Objective at some other time. Until then, folks, always check your premises. Peace. <laughs>